Good morning. It's good to see all of you here on a rainy day, but we're going to be talking about light, so maybe the contrast will make the text come alive even more. Um, so I know we have a lot of new folks with us this year, so I just wanted to take a minute and introduce myself. Uh, I'm Michelle Kirtley. My husband and I have been coming six or seven years to the Bible Church. We have four kids, um, sixth grade, ninth grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. Um, not quite all teenagers, but my sixth grader sometimes thinks she is. Um, and I'm delighted to be doing John with you all this year and um, this passage especially this morning. As Aaron said last week, the question, who is Jesus, is the most important question that any of us have ever asked. And this is not just an abstract or philosophical question. It's a very practical question. It makes an immense difference in how you got up this morning, the assumptions you make about your future, how you treat the people around you. The answer to the question, who is Jesus, has profound implications for our everyday lives. And I hope that that's what you're gonna see over the course of this year. And imagine John, who's nearing the end of his life, writing 30, 40, maybe even 50 years after the events that we're gonna read about. And he's trying to think about what did he want to make sure that people understood about who Jesus was. Well, that's all encapsulated right here in these first 18 verses. The first 18 verses of the chapter, first chapter of John serve as an introduction to the entire book, what we might call today an executive summary, although I'm sure they didn't use that word then. Because you see, John was not just beating around the bush and dropping little clues throughout the book for some big reveal at the end at the cross. He starts the book by telling us everything he wanted to know, us to know about John. In these few verses, we in fact actually have a summary of the whole narrative of scripture, an artistic encapsulation of the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And even though I use the word executive summary, this is probably one of the most poetic and beautiful executive summaries in the history of literature. The very artistry of the text was John's attempt to reflect the beauty and wonder and majesty of Jesus. And we are meant, therefore, not just to digest it or understand it, but rather like a piece of art, we're meant to behold it and allow its truth and beauty to transform us. So that's the image I'd like you to, guys to have in your head as we go through today, that this is a piece of art that is saying more in its artistry than mere words could say. And let that beauty wash over you and transform you. There are multiple ways to look at the structure of the prologue, and we're gonna take it in two sections, which are parallel to one another. Uh, the first section is gonna be verses one through 13, and the second section is verses 14 through 18. And because this is such a short passage, I have the time to read a lot of scripture this morning, so let God's word wash over you as well. Verses one through five. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the beginning. This is, of course, how Genesis begins, as you saw in your study this week. And in referencing the very first words of the entire scripture, John goes back farther than Mark, who started his gospel with the ministry of John the Baptist, farther than Matthew, who started his with the genealogies of Jesus, going all the way back to Abraham, and farther even than Luke, who started his gospel with the birth of John the Baptist, and traces Jesus' ancestry all the way back to Adam. No, John, who wrote last, started his gospel in the beginning. 
Genesis tells us that creation was brought about by God's word, his speech. He said, let there be light. And throughout the Old Testament, as you saw in your lesson this week, the word of God is connected with God's work in creation. You saw that in Psalm 33 and Isaiah 55. God's word is also connected with the deliverance of his people. Psalm 107.20 tells us, he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. In fact, at times in the Old Testament, the word of God is personified. And this personification of the word became even more pronounced in Jewish writings in the time in between the Old Testament and the time of Jesus. And this personification hints at something more. And this is a place where I found the Bible Project and N.T. Wright both very helpful. Um, If you think about our words, they're both part of me and separate from me. They are part of me in that my words come from my breath, my thoughts, but when they leave my mouth, they go accomplish something in the world, at least sometimes. And some words have life-changing implications, like, will you marry me? Or, you're fired. Those words are part of me, and they're separate from me. And as the story of scripture unfolds, not only is God's word personified, but God's wisdom is also personified. And we see that in Proverbs 8. The whole chapter is lovely, and um, if you have time to go back and read it, I encourage you to do that, but we're gonna start in verse 27. When he, God, established the heavens, I, Lady Wisdom, was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I, wisdom, was beside him. Like a master workman, I was his daily delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. It's very curious, isn't it? Wisdom is personified to such an extent that wisdom is beside God in creation, and he, she, Lady Wisdom, is the delight of God. In this chapter, God's wisdom is both the means through which God creates and a gift, something in whom God delighted. And what I want you to see from both of these things is that for his Jewish readers, John's introduction of the Word, who was both with God and was God, would actually echo familiar ideas, even for a people like deeply committed to monotheism, to the fact that there is only one God. But make no mistake, John is taking those ideas to a dramatically new level. He is reinterpreting their expectation of the Messiah, or rightly interpreting their expectation of the Messiah, that he would not only bring the word of God, that's what they thought, the Messiah is gonna come and bring God's word and God's rule. No, no, the Messiah actually was the word of God. He was the wisdom of God who was with God in creation. You see, John, who was steeped in the Old Testament scriptures and had 30 to 50 years to reflect, and the Holy Spirit could inspire him to draw on this story of Old Testament scripture and the themes of God's word and God's wisdom to help the Jews understand who Jesus is and why he came. But of course, his message isn't just for the Jews. For those steeped in Greek thought, John's use of the word this word, the word, would also have echoed ideas with which they were familiar. You saw this in your lesson this week. The Greek word translated as logos has a lot of meanings, and um, in one sense it was a term that Greek philosophers had used when they sat around and debated the ultimate purpose or meaning of life. In fact, this idea had been around for several centuries by the time of Jesus, and by the time of Jesus, a lot of the leading Greek philosophers had decided that this meaning or purpose from life, there was no actual personal God, that there was just this impersonal force, this rational principle, this logos that governed the universe. In fact, some, such as the Stoics, they were a group of philosophers who were around at the time, had concluded not only that there was um, no God, but that this was all one could do was just live a moral existence and be done with it. There was no relationship, and there was no joy. So John is drawing on this idea of logos, which 
like literally was one of those kind of words, I can't even, I couldn't even think of anything that would be analogous today, but it was one of those words that the academics would regularly use in debate. It's kind of how you showed you were smart back then, is like, what do you think the logos is? And they would have these conversations, at least the wealthy elites um, would have those conversations. And John turns all of this on his head, because clearly for John, the logos is not an abstract principle, but it's a person and a person who's gonna reveal himself to us in the pages to come. So the Jews would hear those familiar phrases in the beginning and have this image of the word who was with God and they would likely think about the same passages that you looked up. Sorry, my pages are. And the Greeks would hear the word logos and they would think about things in their story that caused them to think about ultimate purpose and meaning. So John is taking one word speaking to both audiences, as if to say that all God does in the world, all that gives life, meaning, and purpose becomes visible in Jesus. When John says the word was with God and the word was God, the word used for with here is not the ordinary word with, like I have a cup of tea with me. It's the word with that people use when they're in intimate relationship. And we do that too, right? You might be at a party and say, oh, he's with her. That's the kind of with that the word that's used here means. The word was with God, and the word was God. The word was with God, an intimate relationship. In his series of sermons on the prologue, and just so you know, Tim Keller has four sermons on these 18 verses, so we're gonna be doing well to get through all this in 30 minutes today, and I highly, highly recommend them. Um, But in his series of sermons on the prologue, Tim Keller sums up what we learn about the word here, um, saying that, you know, clearly John is introducing the idea of the Trinity, that God is one, but he's more than one in one. And he hasn't gotten to talking about the spirit yet, but he's talking about the word who was with God. And Tim Keller said that in these few verses, we see the Word and the Father in loving communication and coordinated creativity. Loving communication because the Word was with God, an intimate relationship, and coordinated creativity because the Word was with God at creation. In fact, the Word was the vehicle, the means through which God did create all that we know and see. So the Logos, God's word, God's wisdom, was with God before creation, was active in creation, bringing life and light to the world, which is what we see in verse three. And seamlessly, using the fact that the word of God as creator brings life and light into darkness, John shifts the image that he's using now from word to light. Verse four, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Of course, light and life are two essential parts of creation. Without light, there could be no life. I'm a biologist, I won't bore you with all of the details, but you know this is true. If your plant doesn't have light, it dies. There are some deep places in the ocean where you might not need light, but for the most part on this planet, you need light for life. The two things are bound up together. You may, for those of you who have been students of the word for a long time, verse five, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You may be more familiar with a translation that says the darkness has not understood it. Well, it turns out that this word could be translated either way, overcome and understood. And a lot of the commentators actually think that just as he did with the word logos, where he was presenting something for Jews and Greeks, in this word that has been translated overcome, he actually intended both meanings at the same time. The darkness has neither overcome nor understood the light. Moving on now to verse six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. Now at first, verses six through eight may seem like an abrupt shift in tone. We went from lofty poetry to sound something that sounds pretty basic prose. But I'm told, I do not know the original languages, but I'm told 
that even these words have what one commentator said was a solemn, stately style. John is trying to use his artistry even as he's shifting his tone in the passage. And after what could sound like very abstract and certainly theologically deep poetry in verses one through five, John here in verses six through eight wants to be sure that his readers understand, that we understand, that all that's to come is not just abstract philosophy, but it's grounded in history. Everyone who was alive at the time that this gospel was written knew about John the Baptist. His ministry is described in all of the other gospels, and John is now connecting all of these transcendent truths about Jesus with historical details that would have been known to his audience. John the Baptist, if um, you're not familiar, was an old school, Old Testament style prophet who wore rough clothes and ate locust and honey and warned the Jews to repent for the kingdom of God was at hand. And Elizabeth is gonna talk more about John the Baptist next week, but John, the writer of the gospel, assumes his readers are familiar with his story. And for now, in the prologue, John wants to emphasize, John the writer of the gospel, wants to emphasize two things about John the Baptist. First, that despite how famous he was and the good work that he did, he was not the light. And second, he wanted to emphasize that his role was to be a witness. The word witness here is meant, just as it is in English, to conjure the image of a courtroom, someone who can testify and confirm the truth of an event or truths that are being contested. And this theme of witness is another theme that we're gonna explore in the coming weeks, so be on the lookout for all of the times that John tells us that someone is being a witness. And the purpose of John the Baptist witness is stated very clearly, that all might believe through him. Throughout these verses about John the Baptist, John sticks with the image of Jesus as the light. And that's gonna be another theme that you're gonna find is woven throughout the book. And he follows this thread of the light right through to the next point in verse nine. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. True here means real or genuine or the fullness or ultimate. Not that John the Baptist was a false light, but he wasn't the truest, fullest light. John the Baptist was merely a witness to the light, but the true light was coming. And here, the light which gives light to everyone is general creation light, not specific salvation light, and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks as well. The light that was coming into the world is for everyone, but this light that shines on us all forces a response and creates a distinction And that's where John takes us next. He goes on in verses 10 through 11 to say, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. As Dutch theologian Herman Ritterbos put it, the world to which the Logos came was his own creation. The world did not know him, not because he was a stranger, but because it was estranged from him from its origin. Let me read that again. The world did not know him, not because he was a stranger, but because it was estranged from him from its origin. As we learn from Genesis, mankind rebelled against its creator king. We were created in an overflow of infinite love and joy, and we chose instead to go our own way. And so we are estranged from our very creator, from our origin. And let's sit with this a minute. When you think back to the joy, the withness, the love that the son and the father had from the beginning of time, Tim Keller calls it this circle of joy and love that was so rich and deep and had to be shared between one another that it overflowed into creation. That withness, was treated with rebellion. And so the sorrow of these lines is heart-wrenching. He was in the world, the world was made through him out of overflowing love and joy, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. 
The word world, as John uses it here and often throughout his gospel, is not merely the whole of the created order, what we would call the cosmos today. That's what the word is in Greek, too. But rather, the way John uses the word world here is specifically referring to a creation that is estranged and hostile to its creator. As in other places in scripture, when this world that's estranged and hostile did not know him, this no is that intimate knowledge, not just intellectual knowledge. He made us and we are estranged from him. We did not know him. And verse 11 makes this all the more poignant by highlighting that even the Lord's own people, the people he called by his name, who as we learned in Exodus 19, six, he delivered to be a people for his own treasured possession, to reflect his light to the nations, his own people did not receive him. Now the word receive here should call to mind images of hospitality. We do this in English, right? We receive guests. The word, the light, was entering the story that he authored and the proper response to such a visit would be what? Expansive and gracious hospitality, right? Rolling out the red carpet. But his own people did not welcome him. And think about this with me for a minute. Imagine a king whose children throw off the good gifts he's given them and want to live their own way. Maybe, regardless of your thoughts about this, work with me here, maybe this is Harry and Meghan, the royal prince and princess who've said, nah, we don't want anything to do with the royal family. What would be the right response if King Charles shows up on their doorstep? They're estranged, King Charles shows up, they should welcome him, get out their finest china, make tea and crumpets by the fire, whatever it might be. In welcoming him, there would also be reconciliation, because there would be a turning of repentance. Welcome involves the first steps of repentance. But John tells us that the creation and even his own people rejected the word, the light, the king who was coming into the world, coming to rescue us as we are breaking under the weight of our own rebellion and to restore all the disorder and chaos and pain and brokenness that our rebellion has caused in the world. The king was coming, but the estranged did not receive him. John, in these earliest verses of the gospel, sets up a contrast that he's gonna use for the entire rest of his gospel. Those who respond, who welcome the light, and those who do not. But for those who do respond, there is great hope. Look at verse 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. For the estranged who welcome Jesus, for those who believe in his name, and we'll talk about this more, but what this basically means is that those who believing in his name means accepting him for who he said he was and who he showed himself to be and repenting by extending him this welcome. For those who receive Jesus and believe in his name, he gave the right and the power to be children of God. And here again, as one scholar said, we see evidence of the unity of the Father and what we'll learn later is the Son, the unity of the Word, the Light, and the Father. Who but God can grant adoption into his family? Only the author of life has the authority to grant us new birth and adoption. And in this short set of verses, John draws our attention to both of these ideas. The Word is the author of our story. And as such, he's the one where with authority over us, we are his. And when we welcome him and believe in his name, the one with all authority, the word, the life who is the light of men, through whom everything was made, he grants us the right to be born again, to be adopted into his family. Now a fun fact as you go through John, all the other gospels and in many of Paul's letters, you'll see believers called sons of God. But John never uses this term. He always refers to us as children of God. He really wants to draw attention to the fact that our adoption is a new birth, an idea that he introduces here, but he's gonna explore more in chapter three. So let's look back at the structure of John, um, of verses one through 13. 
we have the description of the word and his relationship to the father in verses one through five. Then we have this kind of interjection about John the Baptist, almost an interruption in verses six through eight. And then we have some verses noting about how the word was received and rejected. Well, this pattern is now repeated in the next section, verses 14 through 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So you see here in verse 14, just like in verses 1 through 2, we have a description of the word and his relationship with the Father. Then in verse 15, we have an apparent interruption about John the Baptist, just like we had in verses six through eight. And then in verses 16 and 17, we have verses about receiving his grace, about who welcomed him, which is parallel to verses 10 through 11. And when we point out structure like that, we're not just saying like, oh look, we're very clever, we see structure. Nor are we trying to read something into the text. We really are trying to take the text on its own terms. And so what this parallelism does is it introduces us to an idea that, um, well, the Bible Project referred to this as Jewish meditation literature. And if you were with us in Leviticus, we talked about this. The Jews did not present things they wrote linearly. They liked to take paths that would circle back and circle back and circle back. So you really had to chew on things. So when you see something that's parallel, so verse 14 is like verse one and two, you're meant to say, oh, that sounds familiar. In what ways is it the same? In what ways is it different? And what does that tell me about who God is? You're meant to to chew on these ideas. And here, what this means is that the word who was with God in the beginning, the word who was God, through whom all things were made, that's what we learn in one through two, This same word became flesh. This is an absolutely mic drop moment in the biblical story. At the beginning, only two chapters after the sentences John alluded to in verses one through two, as we've already talked about, at the beginning there was a kind and loving king whose beloved people rebelled against him, bringing death and darkness where there had only been life and light. And because of that, the king could no longer dwell with his rebellious people who had wanted to rule themselves instead of submit to his loving rule. So he left and left them to their own devices. But as he left, he promised to return. And the whole biblical narrative hangs on the promise of the king who was gonna return. Now he returns in the form of the nation of Israel and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But you are waiting, if you read the story of scripture for the drama that it is, as the kings like screw up and screw up some more and screw up some more, by the time you get to the end of Malachi, you're thinking, when is the king coming back? Is he ever gonna come back? You see, the drama of scripture is a grand story of rescue and deliverance. If you were here with us for our study of Exodus and Leviticus, you may remember Exodus ended on a cliffhanger They build the tabernacle, God's glory fills it, and what happens? Moses can't go in. And then we have Leviticus where he makes up a lot of rituals to enable them to at least least meet with him in the tabernacle, at least have some way of being with him. But the rest of the Old Testament describes the failure of the people to ever live up to their end of the bargain, and it closes with utter heartbreak. In Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord left the temple for the final time. The one place on earth where heaven and earth could meet and the world could know the presence of the living God, the glory of the Lord departed the temple. But even in the midst of this heartbreak, the Lord promised, and if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and Daniel, even in the midst of that heartbreak, the Lord promised that he would not abandon his people forever. He was gonna come back. The king was gonna come back. And the shocking claim of verse 14 
the word became flesh, was that the king has come in, a, in an astounding way. The word became flesh. The king became one of us. Verse 14 is the climax of the prologue and is really a seismic shift. And it's really the thing that makes Christianity distinct from any other faith on the planet. The word, the creator, the author of the story entered our story. He became flesh. As you saw in your study this week in verse 14, the verb translated dwelt literally means pitched his tent. And of course, this is meant to call to mind an exodus after the Israelites were rescued from Egypt. While they were wandering in the wilderness, the Lord met with Moses in a tent called the tent of meeting. Exodus 33 verse seven reads, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Skipping to verse nine, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of the cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. Skip to verse 11, thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. The Lord then gave instructions for Moses to oversee the building of the tabernacle, which was called the tent of meeting, because it was the place where heaven and earth met, which would be filled with the glory of the Lord. As D.A. Carson put it, in Exodus, Moses hears the divine name spoken by God himself. This is in Exodus 34, five, and we're gonna read that in a minute. Moses hears the divine name, and this is followed by God's word written on two stone tablets. Now John tells us God's word, it's not written on stone tablets. It has become flesh. His self-expression, his name, all of who he is has become flesh. Or as the author of Hebrews put it in the very first verses of his letter, in the past God spoke to us, to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. In verses one through two, John hyperlinks to Genesis. In verses 14 to 18, he's hyperlinking to Exodus. And in grounding his gospel in the Old Testament scriptures, John is telling his readers, Jesus is the fulfillment of the entire biblical story. Or as the folks in the Bible Project put it, Jesus is not just the fulfillment of the story of scripture, but the reality to which all of the Hebrew Bible points. But there is more that makes verse 14 such an astounding claim. Not only has the king returned as one of us, John says that in his incarnate human form, he and the other witnesses, we saw his glory. We gloss over this because we're not steeped in Jewish history and culture, but for the Jews, this too would have been utterly shocking. The Greek word for glory is doxa, which is how the Greek translation of the Old Testament translated the Hebrew word kabod. And this word glory usually means, as D.A. Carson said, the visible manifestation of God's self-disclosure. It carries the idea of weightiness, the weightiness of ultimate reality, truth, and beauty. So don't miss what John is saying here. The creator God, the word became flesh to be the place where heaven and earth meet. And when they were in the presence of Jesus in the flesh, they saw the glory of God. And this glory is always full of grace and truth. It has always been full of grace and truth. Let's go back to Exodus in 34 verse five. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, Moses there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. As you saw in your study this week, grace and truth is a New Testament way of saying steadfast love and faithfulness. This aspect of the Lord, these twin truths that have always been together, the very character of God as he revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai. In Hebrew, steadfast love and faithfulness are the words hesed and met. Mercy 
and truth, or grace and truth. God's glory is always full of both grace and truth. In Isaiah 6, when Isaiah saw the edges of the robe of the Lord as it filled the temple, he saw the truth of his sin. He said, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips. And what did God do? He touched the coal to his lips to cleanse him. God's glory is full of grace and truth. And this grace and truth was visible to the eyewitnesses in the word made flesh. Verse 16 goes on to say, for from his, the word's fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace upon grace, our cup is overflowing with grace on top of grace. In verse 17, despite how it sounds in the English, John is not setting up a contrast. This is grace on top of grace. As we saw in Leviticus, the law is in fact a grace. The Israelites didn't have to wonder what God required of them or how to please him. That was a grace. He was clear. He gave merciful provision for the ways that they would intentionally and unintentionally fail. That was a grace. The law that came through Moses was a grace and a mercy. But now we have been given grace upon grace, overflowing grace through Jesus Christ, who as we read in Matthew 5, 17, is the fulfillment of the law. Then John ends the prologue this way. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So this verse, along with verses one through two, form what New Testament scholars like to call an inclusio, where a repeated idea acts like little bookends or a frame on a passage. And here, John's returning to the idea that the Word had an eternal relationship with the Father. And this Word, who was with God, has made the Father known. The phrase, who is at the Father's side, literally reads, who is in the bosom of the Father. Again, the language is full of intimacy and love. As Tim Keller puts it, the Gospel writer John describes the Son as living from all eternity in the bosom of the Father. This is an ancient metaphor for love and intimacy. Their love and their joy existed before time. But before Jesus, no one was able to behold the glory of God. When Moses asked to see God's glory, this glory that is overflowing with grace and truth, Moses was only able to see God's back. You see that in Exodus 33, 18, through 23. I'm not going to read that now. But verse 23 ends with God saying, my face must not be seen. But now, Jesus Christ, the only God who sits in the very lap of the Father, has made the Father known. And notice carefully what John does here. He does not say, no one has ever seen God, but Jesus Christ makes him visible. Now, I just said a minute ago that eyewitnesses saw the glory of God when they were with Christ in the flesh. So he used see there, but now he uses no. In fact, he says no one, the word for no here is actually a Greek word exegeo, from which we get the word exegesis. Jesus exegetes God for us. But here's the interesting thing. In Greek, the last line of verse 18 is actually an incomplete sentence. And if you listen to the Bible Project, people talk about that. Apparently, there's no translation that's been able to just leave it that way. Everybody wants to put the direct object in to finish the sentence. Nobody can leave it hanging, but that's what John intended. It's meant to read, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made known, dot, dot, dot. Jesus has explained or made known what? Well, John supplies no object to that verb, and the point is you have to keep reading to find out. Again, John is very artistically setting the stage for all that is to come. But also, this side of when Jesus comes back, Jesus' glory is not visible to all. As D.A. Carson put it, there is a hiddenness to the display of glory in the incarnate word, a hiddenness penetrated by John 
and the early eyewitnesses who had the eyes of faith necessary to see the glory of Jesus, which was most fully revealed at the cross. And this is gonna be another theme to watch for that's gonna be more fully introduced next week and in the coming weeks. Jesus invites us to come and see. Watch for that phrase as you go through your study this year, come and see, come and behold. But eyes of faith are required to see the glory of the upside down kingdom, where the glory of the word who's existed before time with God, where this glory is made most visible in the shame of a Roman cross. It takes eyes to see glory in the upside down, eyes of faith to see glory in the upside down kingdom. One day, God's glory will be visible to all and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But for now, only those who receive him, who welcome him and believe in his name can behold the glory of the word made flesh. I hope you've been able to see that in these few verses, and I was really struck by this when I studied this passage, in verses one through 18, the entire arc of the biblical narrative, creation, he was in the beginning with God, nothing's been made without him. Fall, even though they were created by him, they did not know him. Redemption, he gave them the right to become children of God. And restoration, one day we will all see the glory of God. It's all here in these few 18 verses, and this is grand theology for sure. And part of what I hoped to have done this morning that I hope you were able to do this week is just sit and behold. That's what art invites us to do, right? We sit and we let it wash over us and we let it transform us. And let's be honest, in our busy, distracted lives, I don't take time to do that very much. But as we said, this has profound implications for how you see yourself, how you see those around you, where you find meaning and purpose, who you think you are. Spending some time just sitting and gazing on the beauty of this passage will do a lot to right all of our ships being tossed about on our turbulent waves. What else does this mean for us? Well, it compels a response, and we're gonna see that in John. When you see Jesus, there's only one of two choices. You either receive him or you don't. Now there's a journey to be sure, and we're gonna see some, John is so gracious in showing us some folks that Jesus met who were on a journey. They didn't get it right away. It took them some time. But if you, in your own heart or in the lives of those around you, if you have never thought about have you welcomed Jesus We are the estranged, he has come to us. Have we welcomed Jesus? This truth, going back to what we set into, think about what our savior has done for us. The prodigal son story is so powerful, but in that story, it's the son who realizes his error and who comes home, and the father runs out to meet him, right? But in this passage, what John is emphasizing is who went Jesus, Jesus went to the estranged and he lived with that sorrow for his entire time on this earth. Think about it, he knew every person he met, he would have known them by name, he knew their story and he knew that even though they were his, many would not welcome him. Can you imagine the sorrow? Can you imagine the sorrow of daily meeting people that you love with all your heart who did not welcome you, who don't love you back? And why did he put himself in that position? Well, he did it for all of us and for the glory of his Father. So this this is one of those truths. When I say that I believe that all of this theology makes a profound difference in our lives, this was really dramatically true for me. When I was in my 20s, I was in grad school and Oh, a whole lot was going on in my life. Um, My dad was getting divorced from my stepmother and he was like dating another woman and there was that. And then there was me trying to be an adult and there was that. And there was um, all of these things from my own history with my dad were coming out and um, I would have panic attacks. I had dysfunctional relationships with my friends. I had roommates who would start dating somebody else and that would just send me over the edge because What I realized and what God showed me is that deep 
In my heart, I was terrified of being left alone. I thought I was going to be abandoned. So every time a roommate would start dating someone or get married, that happened many, many times before I got married, um, every time that happened, I literally would start having panic attacks because I thought I was going to be alone. And that was my worst fear. And I was in this phase where I would have very um, heated conversations with the Lord um, <laughs> about my life. And in one of those moments, I sat down, I'll never forget, I sat down in this chair in my room, and I was frustrated and crying, and like, Lord, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be left alone. And the passage that was before me was Jesus on the cross. And the Lord and the Holy Spirit, with such sweetness, said to me, Michelle, you never will be. I was. I was abandoned so that you never will be. I took everything that you were so terrified of, I took that. I took that sorrow, I took that abandonment, so you will never have to. And I'm not gonna say that I was like 100% like functional after that, but it was, my husband will tell you even today that that's not true. Um, <laughs> my children might tell you even more, but um, it was a watershed moment for me. Like I kid you not, it was like, it was the thing that helped me start getting better. That's probably the way to put it. It's the thing that put me on the path. We were estranged, and he took that sorrow of being abandoned not only by all of his people that did not know him, but even on the cross where the Father turned his face. He experienced that rupture in relationship so that we will never. That's how much he loves us. And that makes all the difference in the world. When you're loved like that, what can't I do? What can't I endure? When I'm loved like that and things happen, even the stupid things like I can't find a parking place or I lose my keys, right? Like, if I'm loved like that, I respond to even those minor annoyances differently, much less the deep suffering that life brings. So ladies, I invite you to lean in to the reality that the word became flesh. As you read, John likes to do discourses, and you're gonna hear Jesus say a lot of things. But picture him as he was. He was a real person. John touched Jesus. John ate with Jesus. John heard the things that Jesus said. And in all of that real, earthy, gritty humanness of Jesus, he beheld God's glory. So I invite you to just pray with the Holy Spirit that he will give us all eyes of faith to see that as we do that this year. Let's pray. Oh, Father, the gift of your word even now astounds me. The word that was made flesh, the word that spoke creation into existence, the word that we have in front of us this morning so that we can see you, even though we weren't there 2,000 years ago, to see Jesus in the flesh. And your spirit that enlivens your word, that makes us understand it, that gives light. Lord, where would we be without you? We ask your spirit to make Jesus alive and clear to us today. And I ask that you would give us all eyes of faith so that we can see you for who you really are. In your name we pray, amen.